Hello, my friends from the Dickens Project and the Friends of the Dickens, and welcome to another Dickens to Go. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to try to do something a little bit new, which is to have a conversation with two beloved friends around a favorite Dickens passage. But before we get there, let me tell you that I am Christian Lehman, and I'm coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio, here in my remote workspace. I've been coming to the Dickens universe since 2010. And I went one time, met great friends, and have been back ever since. And I'm Serena Bowie. I'm coming to you from Pamplona, Spain. And uh, my first Dickens universe was Middlemarch. I had always heard about the Dickens universe because I grew up in Aptos, which is really close to Santa Cruz, but never sort of felt like it was something I could attend on my own as a lay person. And then Ricardo and a couple of other people from my church in Long Beach told me they were going, brought me along, and now I'll never miss another year. I'm Mira Rao. I'm in San Francisco, California. And my first year was, if, if, if uh, Christians was 2010, then mine was 2009, I think, with David Copperfield. And so that was my first one. And I started going with family because it's a special time for us to spend together and, you know, have this magical getaway in Santa Cruz. And we just fell in love after the first time and keep coming back. The passage today that we are going to be looking at has a lot to do with friendship, but it also has a lot to do with postprandial potations, let's say. So we want to talk today around David's first experience getting drunk in chapter 24, where he's debauched, dissipated, and drunk. Being a little embarrassed at first and feeling much too young to preside, I made Steerforth take the head of the table when dinner was announced and seated myself opposite to him. Everything was very good. We did not spare the wine. I began by being singularly cheerful and lighthearted. All sorts of half forgotten things to talk about came rushing into my mind and made me hold forth in a most unwanted manner. I laughed heartily at my own jokes and everybody else's, called Steerforth to order for not passing the wine, made several engagements to go to Oxford, announced that I meant to have a dinner party exactly like that once a week until further notice, and madly took so much snuff out of Granger's box that I was obliged to go into the pantry and have a private fit of sneezing, 10 minutes long. So one of the reasons why we picked this passage is because of how fun it is. And so I'm wondering like, what the two of you might see in this early moment. I think to, to me, it feels like where it says, I laughed heartily at my own jokes and everybody else's. It feels like how I, I feel reading this passage. Like everything is funny, everything is jovial. You know, like I'm laughing at my own thinking about my, my own memories and also David's memories and feeling just this kind of everything is funny and joyful. It's also fun to see David who in his childhood and especially around Steerforth is often sort of more reserved suddenly with the liquid courage be a little bit bolder calling Steerforth to order for not passing the wine making engagements to see people we get to see a sort of different side of David, which is fun. Yeah, and definitely I think we see his enthusiasm. Uh, Mira, I hadn't thought about this until you pointed out the laughing heartily at the own jokes because he just made a joke with hold forth since he's been talking here about steer forth. And so it's like, I are you laughing you, at my textual joke? I noticed you reading that. I also, just some of the turns of phrasing is so funny. Private fit of sneezing 10 minutes long. It's great. <laughs> And we continue. I went on by passing the wine faster and faster yet and continually starting up with a corkscrew to open more wine long before any was needed. I proposed to Steerforce help. I said he was my dearest friend, the protector of my boyhood and the companion of my prime. I said I was delighted to propose his help. 
I said I owed him more obligations than I could ever repay and held him in a higher admiration than I could ever express. I finished by saying, I'll give you Steerforth. God bless him. Hurrah. We gave him three times three and another and a good one to finish with. I broke my glass in going round the table to shake hands with him. And I said in two words, Steerforth, you're the guiding star of my existence. I love how you read that. I had not seen this before, but this idea of in two words and it breaks up because of a hiccup. That was, a, that was such a good reading. I also noticed while reading it, the I said, I said, I said, really gives you an idea of the rhythm of David's effusive speech about Steerforth and maybe the length of it as well. Yeah, and you can almost sense him taking a drink in between saying all these mm -hmm. things. Like I said this thing and then I did that, yeah. And I, I feel like knowing Steerforth's character, he would not have interrupted him if he was, <laughs> you know, pouring this praise on him. Steerforth's just sitting there be like, let it run, keep it going. Yeah, and then this tiny little bit of, I broke my glass in going around the table. No attention really to the destruction here that's happening. And that's the thing that's really great about this whole passage is it ignores, I think, consequence in a really interesting way because if you finish the book, you know what the relationship between David and Steerforth is. It's a hugely um, problematic and dangerous one at times. And we have just this small hint here of overlooking things that are broken, things that are damaged. Mm -hmm. You have the hands holding glasses around a table. I feel like when I read this, I have an image of cuts and blood on your hands, but then you just kind of roll over and then focus again on Steerforth. You know, like the, the, the blood and the harm and the damage that's being done doesn't matter, I wanna focus on Steerforth mm -hmm. as the guiding star of my existence. And then, yeah, and we have the glass breaking this. I just saw this because of you guys. The sentence also breaks. The one word mm -hmm. is also something that's broken off and it breaks at that moment of exist. And it is this idea of mortality suddenly that comes looming in, in the midst of this. Just the phrases that he uses for Steerforth, dearest friend, protector of my boyhood and companion of my prime, to me is such a romantic thing to say about another person. And of course, guiding star of my existence, very sort of courtly, courtly love there. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing to emphasize, like the erotics between David and Steerforth mm -hmm. that tended maybe to get overlooked at times like in deep in his cups David is enormously effusive here right you can see him going around to shake hands with him it's not with everybody else that's there it's like hey like mm. getting that physical contact Mira will you read I went on by finding suddenly that somebody was in the middle of a song Markham was the singer and he sang when the heart of a man is depressed with care he said when he had sung it, he would give us a woman. I took objection to that and I couldn't allow it. I said it was not a respectful way of proposing the toast and I would never permit that toast to be drunk in my house otherwise than as the ladies. <laughs> I was very high with him, mainly I think because I saw Steerforth and Granger laughing at me or at him or at both of us. He said a man was not to be dictated to. I said a man was. He said, a man was not to be insulted then. I said, he was right there, never under my roof, where the lares were sacred and the laws of hospitality paramount. He said, it was no derogation from a man's dignity to confess that I was a devilish good fellow. I instantly proposed his health. I, one thing I noticed as you were reading it, Mira, is that I think it's so much funnier that the dialogue is being like summarized and reported rather than directly quoted. I said it was not a respectful way of proposing the toast. And he said a man was not to be dictated to. I said a man was. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting thing that Dickens is doing because it might get a little bit insufferable to read drunk dialogue between two people. Just like if you're the sober person in a conversation, it's rarely the most pleasant thing because everybody else is having such a good time and are so wild around you and you feel disconnected, disembodied from that. And here, Dickens manages to convey the drunk conversation without it being irritating at all for us as a reader. Instead, we just see the high spirits that are at 
play. Yeah, I also love the instant turn of David being told he was a devilish good fellow and then instantly proposing the health of someone he was practically ready to propose a duel to two minutes earlier, that sort of drunken camaraderie. Yeah, and it's like one of these moments where you have the silliest arguments. And here it's like, somebody has said, woman, he's like, no, I am going to stand up. Kind of what you were saying earlier about courtly love. David is trying to behave in an elevated manner. And he's like, no, we, we're talking about the ladies. And then you can just imagine everybody has to take a side. Is it women or is it the ladies? I like the moment of, I, I saw Steerforth and Granger laughing at me or at him or at both of us. I think it's pretty clear that David is probably the object of humor here and trying to figure out what other people are thinking. Yeah. You have a small sense maybe of some of this class difference with David, where David is mm -hmm. behaving in a way, like he says, very high, but he's like, he's trying to elevate himself, where Steerforth actually is from a higher class than David. And so it's almost like he's being laughed at for mimicking a class that's higher than him. Mm. Somebody was smoking. We were all smoking. I was smoking and trying to suppress a rising tendency to shudder. Steerforth had made a speech about me in the course of which I had been affected almost to tears. I returned thanks and hoped the present company would dine with me tomorrow and the day after, each day at five o'clock that we might enjoy the pleasures of conversation and society through a long evening. I felt called upon to propose an individual. I would give them my aunt, Miss Betsy Trotwood, the best of her sex. So something I love here is, as you noted earlier, the me, him, both of us, this displacement, because like, he's obviously getting a, more drunk as this goes on. And so now suddenly it's like somebody was smoking, we, and then I, as he's blurring himself between this communal experience and this individual experience. I also like, in comparison to the toast that he makes for Steerforth, the toast that he makes for Betsy Trotwood is just the best of her sex, sort of this chummy, gallant toast, which feels a lot less feminine than the toast given to Steerforth, which is this object of admiration. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast. Wow. And like it fits as well. He's negotiating the valence of the previous debate about woman or lady. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say the best of ladies. He doesn't say the best of woman. He's like the best of her sex. And it really does offset. I love that, Serena, because it offsets like Steerforth is clearly the best of his sex. And mm -hmm. like the, the parallel that's going to be happening there. Uh, it's also I, like Dickens is doing a great job of capturing the feeling of when you're drinking, you have no sense of the consequence. This is not how you're going to feel the next morning. Like, it's not going to be, yes, today at five o'clock, I'm ready to do this again. But what person has not felt a little friendlier in those moments and felt like you found your new best friends? Yes, yes. In fact, it's the experience of an entire week of talking about Dickens. <laughs> exactly. And then you go home and just sleep for a week. <laughs> Maybe you two can help me with this, but... I keep pausing over the word shudder and a rising tendency to shudder. To me, it feels like you shudder out of suppressing disgust maybe, or like you shudder when there's a, I think I have a ghost in my house. So I've been thinking about ghosts a lot lately. <laughs> so like you shudder when there's ghosts and there's like smoke all around. So I pause at that word and I don't know if either of you had any reactions to that. Yeah, I think you're right. It makes me think like, obviously he's consuming more alcohol than he's used to and he's consuming more tobacco than he's used to. But I think he's sort of, like you said, Christian, trying to sort of put on all of these unfamiliar elements, this high class element. And maybe this is sort of some part of him rejecting all of these either like societal elements and just literal physical excess too. And I think it fits me if, if we're seeing some 
discomfort underlying this entire scene of the relationship between David and Steerforth, like part of his feeling sick or nauseous, it's that like the emotional distrust that he also has that he's kind of covering over with this excess of ebullion. And he's like, no, I don't want to think about that. So I'm going to push it back. And in fact, I'm going to like jump into this speech part of things. Mm -hmm. So you could say that there's like a specter of <laughs> how he's feeling or the future that he is suppressing. I'm, I'm really pushing this. <laughs> yeah, I think that this is, there's a haunting. Ah, somebody was leaning out of my bedroom window, refreshing his forehead against the cool stone of the parapet and feeling the air upon his face. It was myself. I was addressing myself as Copperfield and saying, why did you try to smoke? You might have known you couldn't do it. Now, somebody was unsteadily contemplating his features in the looking glass. That was I too. I was very pale in the looking glass. My eyes had a vacant appearance and my hair, only my hair, nothing else, looked drunk. So I love this passage. And uh, one of the reasons why is it's my, a moment where Dickens is able to operate at the extreme level of being very, very funny, but also like commenting on his own craft. And so I'm going to see if I can say this in a way that makes sense. You have David Copperfield, the author, writing David Copperfield at a distance, right? He knows everything that's happened. And so every time David Copperfield, the author, writes the word Copperfield, he's writing kind of his own name. And now we get this scene of David Copperfield, the character, recognizing David Copperfield, the character, as a person. And so there's this really marvelous series of displacements and recognitions that's happening, all of which, of course, are also governed by the fact that Dickens is writing David Copperfield, writing his own discovery of himself as David Copperfield, of himself as Copperfield. And so it just it becomes this kind of hall of mirrors around character and author and experience that I just, I find it thrilling. I don't have any, like, elaborate thoughts about it, but... It's exciting to me. Thinking about all the names that David has over the course of the novel, here he says, I was addressing myself as Copperfield. So he's maybe speaking to a, a version of himself that goes by Copperfield, you know, that he thinks of himself as being, he is this Copperfield when he is drunk and he's talking, he's speaking to that person. Uh, I love that because yeah. one of David's problems is he's constantly being misnamed through everything, right? He's not addressing himself as Trotwood. He's not addressing himself as Daisy, right? He's not using other people's names for himself. Instead, he's using his familial name that like. Hmm. And only in this moment where he is, he's drunk, he, his inhibitions are lower. So in, in that moment, he is Copperfield, which is hmm. maybe a more intimate view into his, into himself. And maybe when he's sober, he's David, I don't know. <laughs> And then he's actually questioning his own actions, right? So we have this immediate action of, hey, why did you try to do this smoking at that thing? But we can kind of picture maybe the author being like, why was I doing those things as a young man? Right? So those elements of regret, because we didn't have any of this kind of regret at the beginning of this scene just a few minutes earlier. Well, and I think, Mira, it was you who said something about this being sort of an intimate moment. And I think those questions, too, they feel they aren't lecturing self-talk of you idiot. They're, why did you try to smoke? It feels very tender the way you would talk to someone younger than yourself. You might have known you couldn't do it. I like that. Yeah. And then it goes on and we get it again, like this, like recognizing yourself in the mirror. But we still get that wonderful displacement. I was very pale, but... My hair looked drunk. Drunk hair. Yeah. And this is this is one of these great moments that I would point to the almost Dickensian, right? It's unexpected. You yet you can understand it and picture it, but it'd be very difficult to articulate. I, I wonder then if we can look at my eyes had a vacant appearance. So that is not unusual. That is not something that he's saying like that is a function of the fact that I'm drunk or that I've had I've had too much, so I, I have now a vacant appearance. That is not called out here. Does he see himself with a vacant appearance mm. all the time? You know, that that's un not unusual. Yeah. And the paleness just struck me as strange too, because typically alcohol makes us a little bit more flushed. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. does he habitually see himself as pale and vacant? I think mm -hmm. is a great point, Mira. 
And I think that's, you know, it's also like unsteadily contemplating that's he's kind of shifting around, but it's also this idea that David really struggles to see himself in different moments. And so he's under a permanent state almost of unsteady contemplation. And uh, then the world around him where he's very uncritical, he doesn't look deeply into his friendships. He loves immediately, he loves hard, and he loves fully. The repetition of the word looking glass sort of feels to me like like a child looking at a magnifying glass, like like looking at things under a magnifying glass where like some things are in sharp focus. In this case, it's his hair. It's kind of like I'm looking through this little porthole into myself from mm -hmm. the future into the past yeah. through this mirror. And I think it, it, we get that invitation because he says that was I too. There's multiple eyes and yet the eye is a singular. And so there is a interesting like multiplicity in the singular that's happening there through that repetition. This is me. This is you, Mira, finish us off. Somebody said to me, let us go to the theater at Copperfield. The theater, to be sure, the very thing, come along. But they must excuse me if I saw everybody out first and then turned the lamp off in case of fire. Owing to some confusion in the dark, the door was gone. <laughs> I was feeling for it in the curtain windows when Steerforth, laughing, took me by the arm and led me out. We went downstairs, one behind another. Near the bottom, somebody fell and rolled down. Somebody else said it was Copperfield. I was angry at that false report until finding myself on my back in the passage, I began to think there might be some foundation for it. Yeah, another great example of what Serena was pointing to earlier of the way in which he's doing the reported drunk behavior is funny without being unbearable or, or cringing. Right. Sometimes if you're, you're watching a show or reading something and somebody gets drunk, it can be very uncomfortable to watch. Mm -hmm. But because of the careful way that Dickens is constructing this with the somebody did this, I was angry, but then I, I gently shifted. Dickens keeps it from being cringeworthy, which of course it will be, we're not going to talk about this, but with the scene with Agnes, it's mm -hmm. no longer funny at all with like mm -hmm. follows. But at this point, it's pure comic. Uh, energy. I also like the last sentence we have here. The last phrase, I began to think there might be some foundation for it is funny, not just because of an understatement, but the word foundation, which I see you already going to underline Christian is like the exact opposite of what it's what he doesn't have right now is foundation. He's very unsteady. So funny plan words there. Yeah. There's also the, the marvelous play of finding myself on my back in the passage. Of course, a passage being a literary passage, mm -hmm. how like, he's finding himself in this written text that's there because like reading himself into it, writing himself into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and how so much of this passage that we're reading here, it feels a little bit like a investigation, like things are happening who is doing them? What is happening? It is, is it me? Who is this person in the mirror? You know, it feels like reporting or, you know, like looking at the clues and discovering, you know, what is, what is the plot and who are the characters? Yeah. And the thing about it as a detective novel, like from the first sentence, right, is he going to be a hero or not? Like mm -hmm. it's a mode of reading this novel through that detective fever quality. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. There's a threat that something dangerous can happen when you're behaving in this way. Like you might forget something or you might be negligent. And we already know like he broke that glass. And so there is danger. And this idea that I think even here, in some ways, David's going to get stuck. And so he has confusion and he, the door is gone. And a lot of David's doors are gone as he keeps moving under Steerforce direction. And it's why he's going to feel so incredibly disconcerted with Steerforce's betrayal later on. Hmm. And Steerforce seems very sober here, at least. Like Steerforce is not struggling with this moment. David has lost control, but Steerforce still seems to be there. And he's laughing. And the idea is, is he laughing at David? Is he? Yeah. I'm noticing on this last page that there's sort of this 
like funhouse mirror warping of time in these moments. Some things seem to happen very quickly, like everyone deciding to go to the theater and then suddenly David is alone turning the lamp off and spends, you know, a rather long sentence like looking for the door, being let out by Steerforth, suddenly falls and then spends another sort of long period of time figuring out that he is on his back in the passage. So this has been a great delight to talk through this. This is a part of what we wanted to expose or share with everybody is just the joy that comes with talking and reading Dickens with friends and seeing new things through other people's eyes. So I know that it's going to be a while until we all are together again in person because we're going to have a remote virtual Dickens Festival this summer around Dickens's Christmas Carol. But that doesn't mean you still can't read Dickens with us for Dickens to go and with each other in this world. Anybody want to say goodbye? Thank you. Did a great Thank job. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Goodbye. Fun.